Welcome to Hey on Haven. I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing chapter two of the tale of Genji, Hahakigi, the broom tree or broom cypress. We'll start with a summary. Genji is now 17. He is trying to keep his romantic liaisons out of the mouths of gossips to the point that his affairs are few. But because he has spent so little time with his wife, remaining chiefly at the palace, there are grumblings from Aoi's household and suspicion that Genji is involved in secret liaisons with other women. During the summer rains, the palace was keeping Monolini, seclusion to protect against evil spirits. As a break in the boredom, Tono Chujo, Genji's brother-in-law, stops by his apartments. They have developed a tight friendship, being close companions in their schooling and amusements, and sharing their secrets with one another. Tono Chujo comes across some letters of Genji's and asks to read those written by fair hands, preferably letters that are full of emotion, and makes a game of guessing who had written which letter. Tono Chujo then launches into a discussion of women. He starts off with a lament that perfect women are hard to find. I am sure that the utter failure with nothing to commend her and the one so superior as to be a wonder are equally rare. He quickly puts women into three categories. When a girl is high born, everyone pampers her and a lot about her remains hidden so that she naturally seems a paragon. Those of middle birth are the ones among whom you can see what a girl really has to offer and find ways to distinguish one from another. As for the lowborn, they hardly matter. Just as Genji is asking for clarification, the gentlemen are joined by two other courtiers, the chief left equerry, Sama no Kami, and the Fujiwara aid of ceremonial, To Shikubu no Jo. The four courtiers share stories and discuss women at length, listing off qualities to look for in a wife. Sama no Kami is seven years older than Genji and admonishes the others to be careful in their affairs, relaying the story of a woman who was too jealous, though she was otherwise quite dependable, and another who was deemed to be too flirtatious after he discovered she had another lover. Tono Chujo relates the story of a woman who was too easygoing and whom, even though they had a child together, he did not visit very often, using the reason that she never asked to be treated better, only ever being accommodating and gentle. This woman, who we will refer to as Tokonatsu, disappeared without a trace after being threatened by the family of Tono Chujo's wife, who discovered the affair despite his efforts to keep the relationship a secret. She is deemed too diffident and therefore not able to truly capture the sustained attention of her lover. Toshikabu no Jo is pressed to share and tells the tale of a woman who was an unsurpassed scholar. The other gentlemen find his story unbelievable and Sama no Kami launches into another sermon, decrying women who know too much and display their knowledge when they should be somewhat learned, but modest in their expression of it, even in their poetry. Genji silently reflects on the perfection of his father's youngest consort, Fujitsubo, who he is desperately in love with. Once the rain stops, Genji takes off to the mansion of his father-in-law. Aoi's perfection makes Genji feel self-conscious, and they remain cool toward one another. The servants remind our protagonist that he cannot remain at the mansion nor travel to his own as there is a directional taboo. Hearing of the newly redone garden of his retainer, Kino Kami, the governor of Ki, and hearing that the women from his father's house were now in residence at his mansion, Genji sets off to spend the night there. Genji leaves his wife's house without ceremony and quickly arrives at Kino Kami's residence. Space is made for Genji and his entourage in haste and his quarters are adjacent to the women's rooms. He overhears them speaking about him and gossiping about a poem that he sent to the princess Asagao. Kino Kami brings refreshments and introduces his sons and the younger brother of the young wife of Vice Governor Iyo, Kino Kami's father. With the attendants drunk and asleep, Genji eavesdrops and discovers that his room is adjacent to the room of the young wife, Kino Kami's stepmother. She calls for her gentlewoman, Chujo, but is told that she is in the bath. Seizing on the opportunity and the good fortune of an unbolted door, Genji makes his way to the lady, announcing that he, a chujo, or captain, had been called for. Despite her protest, he sweeps her up in his arms and heads back to his room so that they may converse. On the way, the chujo that had actually been called for comes upon the pair, but Genji's high status and a desire not to make a scene prevents her from retrieving her mistress. She's told to return in the morning and the door is closed to her. The lady, quite distressed, successfully resists Genji's advances, at least for a while. 
In the early morning, Genji reluctantly returns the lady to her chamber. Upset that he cannot write to the young wife, Genji decides to take her younger brother, Kokimi, into his service. The boy is sent to him, and after divulging some of what happened between them, Genji sends him to his sister with a letter. She refuses to respond. When Kokimi returns without a response, Genji tells him that he and his sister were previously acquainted and secures the boy's loyalty as a messenger. Despite a steady stream of letters from Genji, the young wife remains aloof. Another directional taboo occurs, and Genji uses it as an excuse to attempt a tryst. The lady removes herself from her attendant's quarters and keeps her women close by, thus preventing Genji's approach. Rebuffed, Genji is kept company by Kokimi. The beginning of this chapter is a fascinating look at what a woman, Murasaki Shikibu, believed that men of the Heian period believed about women. It's a detailed look at the ways women were viewed and expected to behave. It's also our first real look at Genji's romantic affairs. Though Genji is thought of as a gallant, so far we know of four women who essentially rebuff him. His wife, Aoi, Princess Fujitsubo, who dismissed his youthful advances, the Princess Asagao, details about her come in later chapters, and the young wife of Yo. I find it interesting that we see so much failure in these early relationships. I'm enjoying each of our five translators. It's fascinating to get these slightly different versions of the same story. The main difference I'm seeing in this chapter is in what people are called. In the introduction episode, I spoke a bit about how people are addressed and what they are called as personal names are just that, personal. I have a preference for the Japanese titles. While I understand that our translators who use English titles do so for the ease of the reader, I think that readers can handle the challenge of a few unfamiliar words. Maybe it would require an extra appendix or glossary of some kind, but readers of many genres are expected to roll with it as their author creates names of new races and peoples in frequently made up languages. We can handle the proper Japanese terms. My dislike of Seidenstecker's chapter one has melted away with chapter two. He hasn't overtaken Tyler for my top spot by any stretch, but I didn't dislike it. Something I do dislike is Whaley's choice of keeping the poems in line with the text. Flipping ahead, I can see that occasionally quoted poems and songs are set apart, but the other four translators all set the poems off separately. This is a good opportunity to talk a bit about the translation differences in the poems themselves. Suematsu has translated the waka into four lines rhyming in an ABAB style. I find this an interesting choice as rhyme is not a component in waka, poetry composed in Japanese. Whaley seems to translate the poems in poetic prose or free verse, as does Seidenstecker. Tyler's translation generally seems to be in Tutanka, though sampling ahead I found that sometimes the poems are 30 and not 31 syllables. Washburn uses triplets of varying but internally the same syllables. Some poems have three lines of 11 syllables, some only eight. One translation difference that stood out to me in this chapter was the reaction of Kinokami to Genji's desire to visit his house. From Seidenstecker, the governor of Ki was cordial enough with his invitation, but when he withdrew, he mentioned certain misgivings to Genji's men. Ritual purification, he said, had required all the women to be away from his father's house, and unfortunately, they were all crowded into his own, a cramped enough place at best. He feared that Genji would be inconvenienced. In Suematsu's translation, Kinokami answers Genji's request to go to his house. Yes. He did not, however, really like the prince's visit and was reluctantly telling his fellow attendants that, owing to a certain circumstance which had taken place at Iyo no Kami's residence, his wife, Kinokami's stepmother, had taken up her abode with him that very evening, and that the rooms were all in confusion. Washburn's take is more in line with Seidenstecker. Genji's request was conveyed to the governor of Ki, who was obliged to make his villa available, though he was a little anxious about the situation. I'm concerned that his lordship might find this offensive, in Whaley, Kinokami says to his fellow attendants, I am afraid we have not sufficient room in the house to entertain him as I would wish. Tyler's take is of course my favorite and captures a bit of everything that the others express. Ki bowed to Genji's command, but he groaned as he withdrew. A difficulty at the Io deputy's house has obliged all his women to move in with me, he said, and my little place is so crowded that I'm afraid he may suffer some affront to his dignity. The subtle differences in word choice and turn of phrase are fascinating. Misgivings, anxiety, a groaned lament. Kinokami didn't really have a choice but to oblige his lord, 
Was he more worried about the propriety of having the women there while Genji was? Or was this place really just too small? No matter what, he, or more specifically his staff, was definitely inconvenienced. Unlike chapter one, which covered 12 years, chapter two takes place in a much shorter span of time. We are in the season of continuous rain, the month of May, according to Suematsu. The summer rains are not our only seasonal reference. In the discussion of women, three festivals are mentioned, the Kamo Festival, the Sweet Flag Festival, and the Chrysanthemum Festival. Modernly, the Chrysanthemum Festival is celebrated on September 9th, but during the Heian period, a lunar calendar was used, and the ninth day of the ninth month might be closer to mid-October. This chapter is a study in Heian femininity. From the discussions of Genji's companions, we learn that a woman should be intelligent but feign ignorance. She should be gentle, but able to express her frustrations clearly when appropriate and in a way that does not upset the man. She should be yielding, but never forward, dignified, but not cold. I'm sensing a theme here, not too much or too little. No wonder perfect women are rare. I pity the young wife. She is one of the middle rank who a high lord has deigned to give attention to. And on top of that, she's married and doing right by her husband. Even though she regrets marrying him, she is a dutiful wife. Our clothing references in this chapter aren't elaborate descriptions, more offhand comments. While Genji is spending too much time at the palace rather than with his wife, Aoi, her household is still taking excellent care of Genji and sending him clothing of every kind and at the height of fashion. It was the responsibility of a wife to properly clothe her husband. Is it any wonder it is joked that being rich is the best quality of a good wife? In fact, another reference falls into this category. The two jealous women, whom Sama no Kami realized only too late was reliable, took pains to keep caring for him even after he had broken with her. On an especially cold and snowy evening, he finds a thick, comfortable robe was warming over a large censer frame, and what she left for me to wear was even more beautifully made than before, and its colors were even more pleasing. Even after I stormed out of the house, she had still been looking out for my every need. It's really too bad he didn't learn his lesson and mend with that lady. Instead, he continued to try to teach her a lesson in not being jealous, and she ended up dying with nothing resolved between them. While the gentlemen are speaking of women, we're given a description of Genji's attire. Over soft, layered white gowns, he had on only a dress cloak, unlaced at the neck. Tyler's footnote says, His white, unstarched gowns are probably two, and his summer dress cloak, Noshi, is probably thin enough to be nearly transparent. He seems not to have on its normal complement, gathered trousers, sashinuki. This is what Anoshi would have normally looked like. But Genji was dressed very casually, no pants, and the Noshi was left open at the collar, which makes sense as Genji is in his own apartments. After the rain has stopped, and Genji has gone to the house of his father-in-law, Sarajin, we're told that the women were delighted to see him, loosely clothed as he was in the heat, and he spoke with his father-in-law through a curtain as he was not presentable. He is likely still, or again, not wearing pants, with his noshi left either open or off entirely. Once at the villa of the governor of Ki, we hear the rustling of silks from the ladies beyond the screens and sliding panels. When Genji sneaks into the chamber of the young wife, she has the bedclothes pulled up over her head. It is important to note that these covers were actually robes. People slept with the outer robes as blankets. Our last clothing reference comes once Genshi has taken the young wife's younger brother, Kokimi, into his service. We're told he clothes him appropriately, treating him as a parent, and having those in charge of his wardrobe make clothes for the boy. I'm finding myself further engrossed as we move into the novel. How are you feeling about the story so far as we start to get to know Genji as a young man? What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for chapter three, Utsutsume, Cicada Shell. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Heian period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.